The leaves had just started to turn colors, and I found myself driving on a stretch of road in West Milford, New Jersey, known as Clinton Road. My buddy, who was a folklore enthusiast, had filled me in on the tales of the area. A notorious 10-mile stretch, it had more legends associated with it than any other road in the US. Stories ranged from ghostly apparitions, strange creatures, to even eerie gatherings of unknown societies. It was near twilight, that perfect hue of orange and purple in the sky, when I started my drive. I remember feeling slightly uneasy as the dense woods on either side of the road appeared to close in on me. As I drove further, the tranquility of the fall season began to be overshadowed by an inexplicable weightiness in the air. In the descending darkness, my headlights caught a glimpse of something by the side of the road, a decrepit looking truck from what seemed like the 60s, parked haphazardly by the side of the road. Being the good Samaritan, I thought I'd stop and check if someone needed any help. I pulled over a few yards ahead and rolled down my window. There was stillness in the air, except for the faint whispering of the wind through the trees. I called out, Hey, anyone there? Need help? To my surprise, a coin suddenly dropped onto the asphalt beside my car. I picked it up and inspected it. It was old and worn out, dated back to 1965. I recalled one of the legends associated with the road, the ghost of a boy who had died under mysterious circumstances, and if you dropped a coin on a certain bridge, he'd throw it back. Was this the bridge? A shiver ran down my spine. Just then, the old truck's headlights blinked to life. Its engine roared and it started moving, backward. The vehicle didn't turn around. Instead, it backed up at an alarming speed, headlights blinding me momentarily. Fumbling for the ignition, I managed to get my car started and I sped away. The old truck seemed to follow for a bit, but its presence faded the farther I got from that spot. Relief washed over me as I saw the sign indicating the end of Clinton Road. But the coin? It sat on my dashboard, a grim reminder that not all legends are mere tales. It took me weeks to muster up the courage to drive by that road again. By daylight, of course. Whenever someone asks me if I believe in ghosts or paranormal activities, I simply show them the coin, a testament to that eerie autumn night on Clinton Road. I work as a bartender in a quaint town nestled in the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia. The establishment I work at is housed in a heritage building, standing proudly on the main street. Over a century old, it opened its doors, I believe, as a hotel in the 1920s, or perhaps even earlier. From the moment I began working there a year ago, whispers of a resident ghost circulated among the staff. My general manager and co-workers would recount their eerie experiences, unexplained events that left a chill in the air. More than once, as we settled the cash register at the end of the night, items that had no reason to fall would spontaneously tumble, startling us. Inconsequential things, like plates with sugar or salt, would suddenly take on a foreboding presence. However, one particular night stands out, an experience so strange that I still grapple with its reality. It was nearing midnight, our official closing time, and the only souls remaining were my general manager, the chef, a line cook, and a friend who awaited my shift's end. Given the peacefulness of the evening, 
I had wrapped up my duties early and decided to step outside for a cigarette. Adjacent to the bar is a liquor store, accessible from the back of our building. A stairway leads down to the back street, and to the right, there's a door to a shared storage room, which proves handy if we ever run low on supplies during a busy evening. Only a privileged few, my general manager among them, possess a key to this room. As my cigarette neared its end, I began my ascent up the stairs. Midway, I noticed a hand from within, pulling the back door closed. The light from the room streamed out, and I presumed my general manager had ventured in, perhaps to retrieve something. However, as I entered the bar, there he was, seated as before. Puzzled, I said, I just saw someone slip into the storage room. I thought it was you, but here you are. His casual demeanor shifted in an instant. Rising briskly, we both headed to the storage area. He unlocked the door, disarmed the alarm, and scoured the room. Moments later, he returned, confirming that the room was empty. We often play pranks on each other, but the gravity of my expression assured him that this wasn't one of those times. With a mix of amusement and unease, he said, Well, it seems like you've had your introduction to our resident ghost. Welcome, I guess. The moving shadows in the corner. So it was a regular night, and I was just lying in bed scrolling through my phone. You know how it is, winding down. My room was dimly lit by my bedside lamp, and everything was normal. Then out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something odd. It was like a shadow, or more like several shadows, sort of shifting around in the corner of my room. At first, I thought my eyes were just playing tricks on me, because it was late and I was tired. But the more I looked, the more I realized these weren't normal shadows. They were moving, like swirling and twisting, in a way that didn't make any sense, especially because there was nothing moving in my room to cast them. I sat up, trying to focus, thinking maybe it was a trick of the light or something. But no matter how much I changed the lighting, the shadows kept moving, almost like they had a mind of their own. It was like watching dark smoke move in slow motion, but there was no source for it. I got out of bed feeling a mix of curiosity and a creeping sense of dread. As I moved closer, the shadows seemed to react, moving faster, almost as if they were aware of me. That's when I really got freaked out. I turned on every light in the room, but those shadows in the corner, they just stayed there, unaffected by the light. I didn't sleep much that night. Every time I looked at that corner, the shadows were there, moving and swirling. In the morning, they were gone. I thought maybe it was all just a dream or my imagination, but it happened again on several other nights. I've tried everything, rearranging my room, getting different curtains, even having a friend stay over to see if they saw it too. They didn't, but I still see it. Those weird, moving shadows, always out of the corner of my eye. It's gotten to the point where I avoid looking at that corner at night. I don't know what it is, but it definitely has me looking at my room in a whole new way. Our next story comes from Moonfire. I have so many, but I'll submit my experiences one at a time. I'll start with the basement apartment in 1992. I hate it when landlords or realtors don't tell you that a place is haunted. For five months too long, I stayed at a seemingly nondescript apartment 
in Nampa, Idaho. Less than a month in, I had my first encounter with my dead roommate. He appeared hovering over me in bed and woke me up. His form was a long, stretched out black, cloudy, swirling mass. He had no face and a skinny little head. He looked down at me a couple of times as though scanning me. Then I found my voice and screamed at it to get out. He flew away backwards into the wall and disappeared. Three weeks later, he came back. I felt an angry presence in the room and slept on the couch instead. The next night, I returned to my room. I was awakened later by someone sitting down on the bed, staring at me. My feet even rolled into his form. I was terrified, but too afraid to move. Then I realized he could do something to me if I didn't wake up. I wiggled my toe and woke up. He was gone. And about a month later, I was too. I found out from the landlord that there was a guy in there that had himself before I moved in. Seems like he never quite left. My Nurse Was a Ghost by Reddit user LolaBunny3000 posted to r slash ghost stories. In 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, I had just given birth. At this time, I could only have one other person in the room with me my entire stay at the hospital. Of course, my kid's father was there, but like the third day, he left to clean up our house and get everything prepared for me and the baby. I had gotten sick and had a c-section, so I had to stay for about four to five days. Well, while he was away, a nurse named Kelly said she would be helping me throughout the day and spending time with me, so I didn't feel so lonely while the father was gone. I couldn't really hold my baby due to me being sick and the pain from the c-section, so my nurses would come in every time that it was time to feed the baby. I noticed that when they came in, they never even acknowledged Kelly. She would go to the farthest part of the room and she would tell me, I'm just going to get out of the way. Now she did tell me that she didn't specialize in what they did. She was just for comfort. So I didn't question anything. The entire day, she was so helpful and encouraging to me. I really believe that I would have broken down if she wasn't there with me. She was such a sweetheart. Well, after about five or six hours, she told me she had to leave and that she would come and visit me before her shift was over to see how I was doing. She hugged me and blew a kiss at my baby and walked out of the room. Later that night, the kid's father came back and he was very upset. He had told me some stuff happened with his mom and that he was sorry he took so long. I was upset, but I told him that a nurse named Kelly had kept me company. As I'm telling him about her, the nurse who was changing my sheets said, who's Kelly? I explained, and she said that nobody named Kelly was in my room or working that day. So I instantly thought about those women who would pretend to be nurses and kidnap children. But my nurse told me I was probably just hallucinating, and she told my doctor. I talked to my doctor, and he said the same thing. Well, a couple of hours later, a nurse that I didn't recognize came into my room and said, I know this might sound crazy, but everyone on the floor is talking about you seeing Kelly. I said, yeah, she was in here with me for like seven hours today. She helped out a lot. We're smiling and laughing while I'm telling her about Kelly and how sweet and funny she was. Then she pulled up her phone and showed me pictures of her and Kelly that looked to be maybe early 2000s. I was smiling because clearly I wasn't hallucinating. Then she sat down and told me that Kelly had died over 10 years prior from DV with her boyfriend. I wasn't too shocked because my entire life I have been dealing with the paranormal, but I got chills because I never had an encounter this deep. The lady gave me a hug and started crying and said, now I know Kelly's okay. Since that day, I've always wondered why Kelly came into my room to help me. I kind of wish I could see her again.
Ghost in the Mirror. So let me tell you about this crazy thing that happened to me. I've always been into spooky stuff, but I never expected to actually experience anything paranormal. It was just a regular night and I was brushing my teeth before bed. I live alone, so imagine my shock when I looked up into the bathroom mirror and saw someone standing behind me. I spun around, but there was no one there. When I looked back at the mirror, the figure was still there, staring right at me. It was this blurry, shadowy figure, kind of like an outline of a person. It was really creepy. I rubbed my eyes, thinking I was just tired or something, but the figure in the mirror didn't go away. It just kept staring, and I swear it felt like it was looking right into my soul. I was freaking out, so I left the bathroom and tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination. But this is the weird part. The next morning, I mentioned it to my neighbor, and she kind of went pale. She told me that the previous tenant of my apartment used to say the same thing, that they saw reflections in the mirror that didn't belong there, and that she'd always written them off. But now that two people had said the same thing, I don't know what to believe, but I can tell you this. I avoid looking into that mirror at all costs, just in case. The Ghostly Sentinel of Acadia. Acadia National Park, with its rugged coastline and dense forests, has always held a certain allure for me, especially because of the Native American history. Drawn by the park's nocturnal beauty, I embarked on a nighttime exploration, a decision that led me to an encounter both awe-inspiring and unsettling. The night was clear, full of stars illuminating the sky. The park was serene, its usual daytime bustle replaced by the quiet sounds of nature. As I walked along the coastal path, the sound of waves crashing against the cliffs was like a soothing backdrop. It was when I reached a particularly secluded cove that I first sensed something odd. A chill ran through the air, distinct from the night's coolness. Standing atop a rocky outcrop was a figure silhouetted against the moonlit sky. It was the form of a man, but his presence felt ancient, otherworldly. He was motionless, gazing out over the ocean, as if in eternal vigil. I stood frozen, watching him. His attire was that of a Native American warrior, with traditional clothing and a feathered headdress. I had heard stories from locals about a ghostly sentinel, rumored to be the spirit of a Native American protector of the land but I had always dismissed them as mere folklore. As I watched, the figure turned and locked eyes with me. His gaze was piercing, but I felt no malice, only a profound sense of sadness and a fierce sense of guardianship. In that moment, it was as if he was communicating without words, imparting a message of respect and responsibility for the land he once called home. I don't know how long we stood there, in that silent communion. But suddenly, as if a spell had been broken, he vanished, leaving no trace behind. The night air returned to its usual temperature, and the sound of the waves regained prominence. I left the cove deeply affected by the encounter. In my subsequent research, I learned more about the indigenous peoples of the region and their deep connection to the land. The ghostly sentinel of Acadia whether a figment of the park's storied past or a genuine experience, served as a powerful reminder to me of the history and cultures that predated the national park, a history that demands recognition and respect. I walked away with a deep appreciation for the experience that I had had, and whatever that experience was, I am eternally grateful for it.
The night was moonless and bitterly cold as I steered my rattling old car down the deserted back road. It was a shortcut I'd taken for years, but tonight the wind howled through dead trees with unusual menace. According to local legend, on certain winter nights like this, a phantom highway would appear branching off from this road, leading drivers to their doom. Though I brushed off such tales, a shiver ran through me as I squinted into the dark. Sure enough, my headlights suddenly illuminated a cracked asphalt path I'd never noticed before. A weathered sign read, Ghost Highway, enter at your own peril. An icy chill rippled through me. This must be the haunted road described fearfully by the townsfolk. Those who entered were never heard from again. Clearly, some force or entity lured travelers to their ends down this sinister passage. I hesitated, gripped by both unease and morbid curiosity. The phantom road awaited, daring me to uncover its secrets, or sealing my fate. Curiosity won out, and I turned onto the crumbling pavement. My tires rumbled as if passing through a barrier between worlds. Instantly, fog rolled in, obscuring the way ahead. I drove slowly, squinting through the white veil that enveloped the car. The stories of this coast highway echoed in my mind. In Japan, a similar mist-shrouded road allegedly led to the realm of the deed, never allowing any to return to the land of the living. In Ireland, a phantom path was said to carry victims away, to be sacrificed to ancient pagan gods. What horrors awaited down this forsaken route? Glowing shapes began to form in the fog ahead. I gasped as they took the shape of hulking men with distorted faces and hollow eyes. They lurched toward the car, emitting unearthly moans. I swerved around the phantoms, breath racing. More began to stagger out of the darkness, clawing with spectral hands. It was as if the tortured souls of past victims now guarded this road, craving fresh prey. Tires screeching, I barely avoided the ghost's grasp. But escape seemed impossible. No matter how far I drove, the road stretched on endlessly ahead. Panic rose in my chest. I was trapped on this endless haunted highway that delivered all into the arms of horrors. In the rearview mirror, I noticed a vehicle approaching fast behind me. It was a battered old hearse, driven by a tall, shadowy figure in a wide-brimmed hat. The mysterious undertaker pursuing lone travelers to ferry their souls. As it drew closer, I noticed a coffin rattling around in the back, freshly filled. Was it meant for me next? I pushed the gas pedal down hard, speeding away from the sinister hearse. It kept pace, inching ever closer. Up ahead, I could make out a crumbling bridge spanning a churning black river. Passing over it might be my only escape from this nightmare road. I blew past the moaning ghosts and raced towards the bridge. Behind me, the hearse's headlights flared, blinding me for a moment. I swerved back on course, engine roaring as I neared the bridge. Rotting planks whizzed under my tires and I braced for the bumpy passage over the river. But instead, I emerged back into the blinding fog. Somehow the bridge had transported me back to the start of the ghost highway, trapped in an endless loop. The mysterious hearse was gone, but the groaning phantoms still surrounded the car, seeking their next victim. Panic surged through me. I was doomed to drive this haunted road eternally until finally the fog spirits claimed me. But I had to fight. Gripping the wheel with white knuckles, I turned the car around back toward the bridge. It was my only hope of escaping this nightmare realm. The ghost's wails grew deafening as I raced back down the road. I would not share their fate. Up ahead, the bridge came into view once more. Flooring the gas pedal, I rocketed toward it faster than before. This time as I crossed the river, I did not slow down. I blasted over the bridge, screaming a defiant cry against the denizens of this haunted road. Blinding light enveloped me, along with the groans of a thousand lost souls. Suddenly, I was through. The fog vanished, and the smooth pavement of the main highway lay ahead, 
bathed in moonlight. Glancing back, there was no sign of the phantom bridge or spirits that prowled it. I had escaped the ghost highway's endless loop. Shaken, I drove on through the cold night, grateful to be back in the land of the living. But the haunted road calls still from the edge of town, beckoning the unwary into its eerie embrace. Those who listen and enter face an eternity trapped between worlds, never able to find their way back home. As an ER nurse, I've seen my fair share of strange things during the graveyard shift, but nothing prepared me for the night that I saw the ghost of a young child wandering the halls of our pediatric ward. It started like any other night, busy and chaotic. We had a bad car accident come in, so all hands were on deck in the ER. Once things finally calmed down around 3 a.m., I decided to stretch my legs and grab a coffee upstairs. That's when I saw him. A young boy, no more than six or seven, peeking his head around the corner at the end of the long hall. He had this lost, forlorn look on his face that struck me as odd. Quietly, I called out, Hey there, are you lost? But he didn't respond. He only stared back with sad eyes before disappearing around the corner. I hurried after him, turning the corner only to find the hallway completely empty. A chill went down my spine. There's no way he could have gotten out of there that fast. I searched every room, every nook and cranny of that ward looking for the boy, but he was nowhere to be found. When I told the other nurses what I had seen, they just nodded. It turns out several of them had seen this ghostly boy over the years, always wandering the halls late at night. We now think he's the spirit of a child who passed away here long ago, still drawn to the pediatric ward where he spent his final days. Though the encounter spooked me at first, I now find it kind of comforting to think that he finds some solace in visiting the kids, like he's watching over them, even from beyond. So, if you ever find yourself in the pediatric ward late at night and see a lone boy wandering the halls, don't be afraid. Just know that he's one of our own, and he means no harm. Back in 2009, me, my mom, and my stepdad moved into a really old, rustic rural cottage in England. My father had passed away not too long before, and this was going to be a new start for us all. The house was an absolute bargain. It had six bedrooms, two very spacious living rooms, and a huge annex at the back that was essentially a second house. We couldn't work out why it was so cheap. We went for the viewing and the family eventually told us that their elderly mother had passed away there peacefully in the annex and they just needed to get away from the feeling of her. That probably should have been a first red flag. We weren't put off though and we bought the house. From the beginning, it was unsettling. My parents didn't see it at first, but I was incredibly uncomfortable there. It was extremely unnerving and cold not to mention it was isolated behind rows of trees and a very long driveway, so far away from anyone else. It started on the first night. My room was at the end of the corridor, and if you came out of my room, on the right was a bathroom and a locked door that led to the annex, the place where the elderly mother had died. My parents slept a long way down the corridor, in the last bedrooms, so I was quite isolated and directly opposite my room were the stairs. This first night, it was freakishly cold. I pulled my blankets up to my head, but after my dad passed away, I had suffered from insomnia for years, so the cold and the anxieties of moving to a new house all added together to create zero sleep. So I ended up laying awake for hours, 
just sort of staring around the room. My bedroom door was one of those old and mismatched wooden country house doors. It didn't quite reach the carpets. And after a few hours, I could hear the creaking of floorboards directly outside my room and shadows that seemed even darker than the darkness of the hallway walking past my door. I presumed that one of my parents had gotten up to use the bathroom at first, but this went on back and forth, back and forth for several minutes. And it was fast. It was a very brisk walk. Not to mention next to my door was the locked door to the annex. Anybody walking at that speed would have hit the door, but nothing. It freaked me out and had me dreading the next night. This kept happening, every night for a few weeks, and I remember vividly one night I actually left my bedroom door open. Around the same time, as always, I heard the creaking. I turned around, and unmistakably, there was a figure, blacker than black, walking forward and backwards in front of the door, just visible in the darkness of the hallway. I couldn't take my eyes off it the entire time it was there. It's safe to say I never slept with the door open again after that night. But this is where things start to get properly creepy. I'd been terrified of this shadow for weeks now. There was a really horrible feeling that I had around it, like it was after me. And one night, as I was going downstairs for dinner, I had the same cold feeling. And for just a second, I froze in place in the dark hallway and looked to my right toward the annex door. And there, sure as anything, and without my sleepy eyes to blame it on, I saw the same black shadow walking directly at me at high speed. I ran downstairs as quickly as I could and I told my parents everything. They mostly laughed it off and didn't believe me and tried to reassure me that ghosts aren't real and there was no chance of anything about this old lady still being in the house. Now, a bit of backstory. This old lady was terrified of the previous owner's family dog, so much so that they had installed a pulley system in the house so she could pull a cord from her bedroom that would trigger an old bell to ring in the kitchen if she wanted anything. The whole system was still there when we moved in. And this night, the night after I told my parents, I was woken at around 2.30 in the morning by this bell in the kitchen ringing loudly and repetitively like it was being pulled firmly and constantly over and over. I ran out into the corridor, and my parents were there too, equally as confused and concerned as I was. We all looked at each other with ever-increasingly worried expressions and ran downstairs into the kitchen to see what was going on. As soon as we entered the kitchen, it stopped. We ventured up into the annex to see what could have caused this, but nothing, no sign of anyone. And my gosh, I hated it there. It was even colder and more lifeless than the main part of the house, and I just felt like I needed to leave as soon as I could. My parents didn't quite believe that this was a ghost yet, but they were clearly less skeptical than before. From here, any activity became much more obvious. All of us, my parents included, started to hear knocking from the annex door next to my bedroom noises from downstairs that sounded like someone was down there moving. Sometimes my fish tank light would flick on and off with an audible click and wake me up. And I would often even wake up to my wardrobe doors being wide open with no breeze in sight. One night, I was sat reading alone in my room, and one of these wardrobe doors opened by itself, wide and with relative force. I got up, cautiously, and closed it and then I ran downstairs to see my parents. When I came up around 15 minutes later, every single cupboard door, around a dozen of them, were open as wide as they could go. Lots more went on too. Taps turning themselves on became a particularly regular occurrence, and one night I awoke to the sound of my cupboard door opening again and saw droplets of water running from the bathroom next to the annex door all the way to a few feet from my bed, with no droplets out again. I was terrified. It was around six months after all this had started that we eventually moved out. 
My grandma had begun to grow unwell and couldn't care for herself anymore, and she moved in with us. From the beginning, she hated that house. My grandma was so incredibly sweet and calm, and I've never seen her distressed like she was there. On one night in particular, when I was sat downstairs in the kitchen with her, she took my hand, pointed directly toward the annex, and said, Don't you go in there. I don't like it in there. It's safe to say this scared the crap out of me. On the last night we all spent together in the house, I was awoken by my mum screaming. Clear as day, she said she felt two hands firmly grab her ankles over the bed sheets and pull her down the bed just a few inches, and right there and then she asked to leave. We went to stay in our old house for a while, but because of size, my stepdad, the biggest skeptic among us, stayed in Lilac Cottage for a few more months. He's still quiet to this day about that house. He hates talking about it, but even he admits that there was something incredibly wrong there. And without much warning, he put the house up for sale selling it so desperately that he lost almost a quarter of the price he paid for it, and he's never told us why. I've promised myself that one day I'll reach out to the current owners of that house and see if they have also experienced anything, but I haven't, at least not yet. We bought a house intending to use it as our second home, but after just a few months, we decided to sell it after some unusual experiences. Long story short, we're pretty sure it's haunted. Our real estate salesperson and the person who bought the home are both aware of the claims and have made an informed decision to purchase it anyway. They probably think I'm nuts. The home is not an old one. It was built in 2019 and we are the third owners. We've gotten an air quality test done in the home, and both my husband and I have both received physical examinations. Nothing is out of the ordinary. We bought our winter home last year. Originally, we're from Canada, but we've spent the majority of the last couple of years between the United States and, more recently, Costa Rica. My first experience there was while I was taking a shower. The house has an ensuite washroom, when you enter the room, if you go to the left, you'll go toward the bathroom. If you go to the right, you'll end up in the bedroom. From the shower, you can see the entrance to the bedroom. One afternoon, while I was showering, I watched my husband walk into the bedroom with a glass of lemonade. I then turned around to wash the soap off my face and turned back toward the door to rinse the shampoo out of my hair. That's when I saw my husband enter the room again with the same glass of lemonade. When I exited the shower, I asked him if he had re-entered the room a couple of times, and he said no. He'd only ever come into the bedroom once, and that he'd been there the majority of my shower. My husband had a similar experience. He was in the backyard looking into the kitchen. He claimed that he saw me leave the kitchen and walk toward the mudroom. He was very confused when he entered the house to find it empty. I had been out for a couple of hours. On multiple occasions, I've heard the sound of my husband's car scraping on the driveway. We have the steepest driveway on the block, and every time he parks the car, you can hear this distinct dragging sound of metal on the driveway. Whenever I hear this, I usually unlock the garage door. There have been multiple times where I've heard this sound, unlocked the door, and he isn't home. We've both heard whistling sounds that we can't explain, that stop once we acknowledge it. I guess it could just be the vents, but for the last three weeks, our thermostat hasn't been working, and we still hear it. There have been other trivial occurrences. Once I woke up in the middle of the night because the fridge door alarm was going off. We also have one of those annoying automatic toilets where the lid lifts when it detects motion. Well, those keep going off on their own too and opening up. I understand that with modern upgrades, there are going to be some malfunctions. So I put those experiences under the questionable category, but there have still been quite a lot of them. We've spent the past week packing our things. 
We're one of those people that just don't store anything in the garage other than our vehicles. The only other thing that we have in there is the water softener tank, and that's it. So one night, the car alarm goes off on both vehicles. Convinced that we're being robbed, we call the police, and of course, the neighborhood security also comes by, just to see that our cars are perfectly in the garage with no signs of an intruder. We officially moved out of that house three days before closing. We couldn't bear another day there. The neighbor texted me to ask what all the commotion was at our house. I told her that I had no idea what she was talking about because we don't even live there. I know this sounds insane, but we have lived in so many houses and we've never experienced anything like this. Even though our house was built in 2019, it was a teardown. There was another house on the same property that was built somewhere in the 60s, I think. So who knows what we might have inherited from that. As a child, like many others, I was accompanied by an array of imaginary friends. Among these figments of my young imagination, the one I remember distinctly was a little girl named Sophie. Sophie, approximately my age at the time, between four and six, was just an ordinary girl wearing a dress and socks. The peculiar thing about her was the noticeable crook in her neck. I grew up in an old house, possibly around 80 years old, with our next door neighbor who we affectionately referred to as grandma and who has lived there for 60 years. This fact bears significance to the story. Sophie was my closest friend during my early years, a phenomenon not uncommon among children. We spent a lot of time talking and playing in my room, but she never ventured downstairs, claiming fear. It was a usual occurrence for me to descend the staircase, turn back and reassure her. Hey, see, it's okay. You can come down. Regardless, she would stay put, a fact I found utterly perplexing. As I aged, my interactions with Sophie dwindled, and ultimately, she faded from my memory. That was until, after relocating, my mother and I paid a visit to Grandma and began reminiscing about my childhood spent in the old house. My mother mentioned my habit of addressing the staircase when I was young, which piqued Grandma's curiosity prompting her to ask, who were you speaking to? I casually answered, oh, Sophie, and I started to describe her. Grandma fell into a silent contemplation. After a while, she said, you know, when I initially moved into this house, my neighbors were preparing to move out. Tragically, a month before their departure, their daughter slipped and fell down the staircase succumbing to her injuries. She had broken her neck. You know, I do believe her name was Sophie. At the tender age of 15, my family and I transitioned from my childhood home into a rental house. My brother and I each selected our rooms, and I opted for the one boasting a larger closet to accommodate my extensive clothing collection. Initially, everything seemed normal. However, as time passed, a disturbing pattern began to emerge. Almost every night, a dark silhouette would appear in my room giving me this overwhelming sensation of dread and terror that seemed to permeate the entire room. I found solace in prayer, invoking the name of Jesus, until the menacing presence abruptly disappeared, leaving me to sleep in peace. However, this disturbing routine was exclusive to my room. If I slept anywhere else in the house, the nights were uneventful. This resulted in me spending over a month in my mom's room after we had guests 
stay over for a week. I never returned to my room for an extended period, even after they left. The visitors never mentioned any unsettling experiences, though I doubt they would have even if they had encountered something peculiar. Even during the daytime, though, a sinister presence just lingered around my room. I would often catch sight of a dark figure out of the corner of my eye, or somewhat directly as I walked past my room, which was located adjacent to the bathroom. The figure would disappear the moment I turned to look at it directly. Years later, when I finally confided in my dad about these hauntings, his response was one of regret. Why didn't you tell me earlier? He asked. We could have had your room cleansed and blessed. I worked at a restaurant located in a remote town in Michigan. Do you recall that show Ghost Hunters? Well, they actually investigated our place a few years back. From what I've been told, there are two spirits here, a little girl and a man. On my first day, curious about the ghostly rumors linked to the TV show's visit, I asked a coworker about it. As she was leaving the room, she casually mentioned, Oh yeah, there's a little girl ghost here. Just as she said that, something knocked the tool we used to retrieve pizzas from the oven right to the floor. Months later, that same co-worker shared another eerie tale. She claimed the spirit would turn on the radio even when it was unplugged. I was skeptical, until one particular incident. It was a bustling Friday evening, with karaoke in full swing making the restaurant quite noisy. Directly above us is an old, condemned apartment, perpetually vacant. Out of nowhere, we heard a series of thunderous steps coming from the ceiling, as if something was charging across that room. Suddenly, an entire stack of full-length hotel pans, each measuring about three feet by one foot and eight inches deep, were violently thrown off the shelf in our kitchen. The resulting clatter was deafening, like a cacophony of stainless steel crashing down onto tile floor. These pans, stacked together, must have weighed around 40 pounds. Just moments before this chaos, I had called out to the manager across the room, asking, did you hear that? About the thundering upstairs. I had this gut feeling that it was the ghost. The restaurant was loud, but the noise above was unmistakably distinct. Before he could even nod in acknowledgement, the stack of pans was flung to the floor. The most chilling part? Our 18-year-old dishwasher was directly in front of the shelf and witnessed the pans being hurled. The shock on her face was something I will never forget. In all, four of us heard the phantom footsteps. One saw the pans being thrown by nothing and several others were startled by the clamor. Given what I've experienced, it's hard for me to remain skeptical. The only other explanation might be a very elaborate prank, but that seems even more far-fetched given the people that I work with. I haven't recounted this tale in some time, so let me give you a bit of background. Between 2003 and 2005, while completing my college education, I worked the off-shift IT role at a historic federal building in Michigan that operated 24-7. This wasn't just any building. Dating back to the 1800s, it had served various purposes, such as a sanitarium and a hospital. The facility even had its own subterrain tunnels used for transporting supplies and, more eerily, bodies, reminiscent of train stations and old cemeteries. On my shift, I primarily worked in two areas, 
the call center, and a secured communications room. The latter was situated in the building's sub-basement, which previously functioned as a morgue. Even though the comms room operated 24-7, with the lights always on, it perpetually felt as if unseen eyes were watching. The room's sensitive nature meant that no one could be in there alone. During the day, a minimum of three personnel occupied the room, while at night, on my shift, it was just two of us. One particular night, as I was engrossed in my homework, I heard a peculiar noise. It sounded like something heavy being dragged on the opposite side of my cubicle wall. I beckoned my coworker, who also caught the unsettling sound. We wondered if any unscheduled work was going on or if someone else was in our secured zone. But after checking, the answer was clear. It was just us. Every door was locked. No one had entered or left. Spooked, we took a brief break outside for our own sanity more than anything else. Oddities were not confined to the comms room. Many reported unsettling experiences in the restrooms, like an invisible hand tugging at their clothes. But perhaps the most unnerving part of my job was navigating the vast gothic structure in the darkness while updating computers. The security guards had a habit of turning off lights in unoccupied sections and I would invariably switch them back on during my rounds. Occasionally, as the lights flickered on, I would see fleeting shadows or hear soft murmurs emanating from seemingly nowhere. While the building bustled with life and noise during the day, masking its eerie history, nighttime was a different story. When it was just me and another colleague, every creak and whisper amplified our fears. For what it's worth, the building is still in use today. However, I've heard that many of those eerie sections are now merely storage spaces, inaccessible to most. I hope that sharing my experiences provided some insight, or at least a good story. I've always been captivated by the supernatural, though I had never had any personal encounters. Being from the Midwest, one of our favorite pastimes was exploring the countryside. My friends and I were particularly drawn to cemeteries, discovering all kinds of hidden treasures. One such was a cemetery nestled on a grassy hill, where the tombstones were concealed beneath the carpet of grass. Another was hidden deep within the woods, across an ancient bridge with no markers in sight. We had perused various local legends about haunted locations, but hadn't stumbled upon any major sites or experienced anything out of the ordinary. As we moved on to college, we maintained our bond, catching up every other weekend or so. One place we'd always yearned to find was a particular cemetery known for its paranormal activity, but its location remained a well-guarded secret. As it turned out, one of our friends had managed to locate this elusive spot, thanks to county directories. Eagerly, we decided to visit. We arrived at sunset, engaging in casual ghost hunting activities like asking questions and recording potential responses. Though we weren't taking it too seriously, there was still an undercurrent of anticipation for a supernatural encounter. In a moment of adolescent recklessness, a friend extinguished his cigarette on a tombstone, hoping to provoke a reaction. I know. After asking another question, we found ourselves enveloped by a profound silence, soon broken by the sound of leaves crunching underfoot. It sounded like someone was approaching us from the darkness, though we saw nothing. Suddenly, the silence was shattered by a scream that seemed to curdle the very blood in our veins. The terrifying event left us somewhat stunned, and it feels surreal to recall it even now. After a moment of frozen shock, we hastened our pace toward the car, gradually breaking into a run, the silence remaining unbroken. 
Even now, I find myself pondering whether it could have been a large cat or some other creature, despite the improbability given the local fauna. But to this day, I have never heard a scream quite like that. And just thinking about it sends chills down my spine. Last summer, my friends and I decided to spend a week at my family's cabin. It was a week filled with a lot of unexplainable occurrences, which reached their climax on the final day. It all started soon after my parents left. One evening, a friend of mine returned from a late night run, gasping about a black figure that he had spotted in the woods. We found it odd, but we didn't dwell on it all too much. The following day was fairly uneventful, except for a late night jacuzzi session around one to three in the morning. We began discussing the scariest dreams we had ever had. It took a serious turn when one friend shared his recurring experience of a tall black figure appearing in his dreams and his room at night when he was a child. The sincerity in his tear-filled eyes was unsettling. As he spoke, I distinctly heard footfalls in the woods below us but I decided not to mention it until the next day. Needless to say, we were all quite unnerved at this point. On the final day, with no specific plans, we lounged around the cabin. As the night deepened, about one to two in the morning again, one friend complained about his towel repeatedly falling off the hook, despite him hanging it up securely. Even stranger, his blanket that was previously on his bed was now strewn about the floor and the bathroom cabinets kept opening on their own. By 4 a.m., shaken by these incidents, we decided to call it a night. Owing to our collective fear, two of my friends opted to stay in my room. As we were settling down, one of them asked if I heard rustling sounds from the kitchen and living room. I didn't. Nevertheless, we cautiously ventured into the living room. The moment I switched on my phone's flashlight, I was gripped by an overwhelming sense of dread. The cushions from the couch and chair were standing vertically, and the pelts that were on the chairs were tossed on the floor. In a state of panic, we fled the cabin and made a rather futile attempt to call the police. Predictably, they couldn't do anything and probably dismissed us as kids hallucinating on some potent substance. It was about 5 a.m. by then, and not a wink of sleep was had that day. The experience of that week remains vivid in all of our minds. Suffice it to say, I'm pretty sure my cabin is haunted. For the past two weeks, my family and I have been traveling around various countries in Europe. Unfortunately, we had our passports stolen in Belgium and had to make a couple last minute changes to our plans, one of which included booking a hotel in a new city for one night. We stopped just for the night between trains in Cologne, Germany. I helped my parents find the last minute reservation online and it was a pretty standard apartment style rental. When we arrived at the rental, we were all impressed by the views of the nearby cathedral and church spires, the shingled roofs, just the general feel of history that the whole town had. We went out for dinner and came back after dark, all heading to bed for our early train the next morning. I shared a room with my little brother and my parents slept in the next room over. I remember asking them if we could swap rooms because I didn't like the layout of ours. There were way too many doors for me to feel comfortable. I have a weird thing where I don't like sleeping near doors and I can't sleep in a room with any doors left open. Anyway, they said no, we could just stay in the original room, which had doors to the kitchen, hallway, and two closets. I was too tired to push it and I figured my fatigue would override my personal habits. So I just got ready for bed and tried to go to sleep. While I was sleeping, I remember having some cycles of regular dreams. Then all of a sudden, I woke up within another dream. 
I was lying in the same bed, in the exact same room, and my little brother was lying in the same bed too. It felt exactly as though I had just woken up normally. Now I have very vivid dreams sometimes, but I've never dreamed about being in the exact room I'm in, and I've never woken up to a dream within a dream. In this dream, I was sitting up in bed and so was my brother. I could feel that for some reason, we were both very scared, and there was this charged and anxious feeling in the room. I remember my little brother saying, what is that? Get out your flashlight. At the same time, we were both looking at the far end of the room, where it was darker and away from the windows. It was like we were both almost too scared to speak, but I could feel that we were both sensing whatever dark energy was at the end of the room. I started to fumble for my phone flashlight, just for some light, when all of a sudden this thing, the closest I can describe it as is a dark blob of energy, moved super quickly over next to my side of the bed. My brother and I screamed at the same time as this thing rushed up next to me. That's exactly when I woke up for real, at about 2.30 in the morning. My heart was racing and I was sweating so hard, despite the room not being hot at all. I was so unsettled that I turned on all the lights in the room and I didn't sleep for about two more hours until I could finally somewhat relax and drifted back to sleep finally. This experience was very disturbing for me. I never wake up early in the morning for no reason, as I usually sleep through the night, and I rarely, if ever, have nightmares. Like I said, I have vivid dreams, but they're usually not bad. I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a phenomenon like this, or if you know what it's called. Can people have paranormal encounters in their sleep while in certain spaces? Was I just having a really vivid nightmare? Or was that experience a signal that something bad was in that room? For context, I live in Germany. My boyfriend's childhood home is old. How old, nobody knows exactly. It might have been built around the beginning of the 20th century, but it could be older. It's a three-level house with a huge archway at the first floor that marks its age. There are two stories I want to tell you. The first one happened when we had just started dating. My boyfriend had searched for his room key for quite a while. It appeared to be lost forever. One day I entered his room and there was the key, laying perfectly placed in the middle of the bed. When he came home from work, I mentioned that I was glad he had found his key. He looked at me confused and I pointed at the door where I put the key in. He said, I never found it. Later we asked his parents and sister if they had placed it there but they denied it. To this day, we don't know how it ended up there. The second story happened pretty recently. The building has two front doors. The inner front door squeaks remarkably if you open it, so everyone knows when somebody's coming inside. My boyfriend's mother and I sat at the dinner table. His dad was watching soccer on the TV next to us on the third floor. My boyfriend and his sister were out of the house. Suddenly, my mother-in-law and I heard the front door. Then another door-like sound. Oh, someone must have come in, my mother-in-law said. She went down the first stair and said, hello. No answer. She decided to take a look herself. Not a single soul in sight. At the exact moment she went down to look, my boyfriend opened the door and came in, just to see the two of us confused we asked if he was mocking us. He affirmed that he hadn't even been inside before, so the door wasn't him. He and his mom both told me that these kinds of things have happened to them before. Doors open, things move, sometimes you hear steps that aren't supposed to be there. Apparently, they call their ghost Herbert, after their uncle that passed away a few years ago. I guess it's a friendly soul.
When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Ital, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single bedroom all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway our rooms were in, I remember almost feeling as though I walked into a wall of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that that wing of the hotel was odd. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about two o'clock in the morning, I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room, because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming black shape was visible in the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only for nothing to be there. The window was locked from the inside, and there was nobody in the closet or the bathroom. My room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing games on my DS. The next morning, we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room. But when she turned on the light, there was nobody there. It was just a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I never got to experience anything after that. But it still freaks me out to this day. Although I've always held an interest in the paranormal, I've remained largely skeptical, favoring evidence-based explanations. I enjoy watching ghost hunting videos on YouTube and browsing through paranormal-themed subreddits. I have visited many supposedly haunted locations in the United States, such as the Omni Parker House in Boston, the Molly Brown House in Denver, the Whaley House in San Diego, Alcatraz at night, and the Winchester House on multiple occasions. Despite all this, I have never encountered any tangible evidence, leaving me to oscillate between curiosity and skepticism. That was until a few months ago. I had arranged a surprise party and weekend getaway for my girlfriend's 30th birthday. She wanted to go skiing, and so I organized the trip well in advance, inviting some of her closest friends. We ended up staying in a large Airbnb cabin in Tahoe, California, nestled amidst numerous similar cabins. It had enough rooms to accommodate all of us, a basement level with two beds, a room on the first floor, and three rooms upstairs. As it was her birthday, my girlfriend and I took the master bedroom upstairs. On the first night, we celebrated with drinks and games. Balloons that we'd set up in the living room kept popping at strange intervals. Someone suggested it was the heater vents causing the pops, but I was doubtful. Yet, I didn't want to stir up any unease, so I simply observed. Later that night, we could still hear balloons popping downstairs intermittently between 2 and 3.30 in the morning. On the second night, after a day out in the snow, the strange occurrences intensified. As we were all quite tired, we decided to call it a night earlier than before. It was then that I had my first eerie experience. It was so cold, so I went downstairs to adjust the thermostat. As I walked down the dark stairwell, I heard the floor creaking behind me, like someone was following me. The noises continued until I reached the thermostat, then stopped abruptly. I felt watched, 
and called out to who I thought was my friend. Turning around, I found no one there. I was a bit unnerved, but kept it to myself and returned upstairs. About half an hour later, I decided to crank up the thermostat again. As I went downstairs, the only creaks I heard this time were from my own steps. However, as I was adjusting the thermostat, I heard the ball from the foosball table nearby roll across its surface and hit the side wall. Startled and unable to explain the phenomenon, I hurriedly returned to bed. On our drive back home the following morning, the topic of the popping balloons came up. Seeing an opportunity, I shared my experiences. As I finished, my girlfriend's friend, who had been staying across the hall from us, turned pale. She revealed that the previous night, she'd seen a shadowy figure at the foot of her bed. Upon waking her boyfriend, the figure had vanished. My girlfriend's cousin, who stayed in the next room, then admitted that she'd heard what sounded like breathing in her room. Alone, these incidents could perhaps be rationally explained, but when considered together, it was hard to deny that something unusual had been happening. This experience has turned me from a skeptic into a cautious believer. As for future encounters with the paranormal, I'd prefer if this was my first and last. In 2013, I worked as a baker in a small cafe in central Arizona called the Wild Iris. It was a super old building and had a reputation for being haunted. I was quite skeptical at the time about all things paranormal, but also curious. I spent a week or so inquiring fellow co-workers about their experiences. I would hear stories from other bakers who would come in at 4 a.m unable to get the lights to work until the 5 a.m. barista arrived. Other stories included things like rags flying off the countertops or moving around while people turned away. Creepy, but not convincing. I remember feeling compelled to have my own experience, and I felt energetically open to inviting something paranormal to happen. During that time, I was scheduled after hours with two other co-workers to dust the air ducts. We were instructed to throw tarps over everything so that dust wouldn't dirty the workspaces. I was in the bakery, which was essentially a tiny workspace connected to the coffee area. I threw a large tarp over one of the rolling speed racks, a tall portable shelving unit. It was filled with empty squeeze bottles for caramel and chocolate sauces. Once I got to the top of my stepladder to begin dusting, I noticed a single squeeze bottle sitting on top of the tarp. There was no storage above the speed rack, so I had no idea how that bottle had managed to get on top of the tarp that I had just thrown over it. I was so baffled, and so were my coworkers. However, I wasn't convinced that it was a ghost. The next night, I was scheduled and I told everybody about my experience. Eventually, it was just me and one other co-worker, the barista, closing the shop. There was only one customer left on the opposite side of the room. I think it was a young man reading by the front door. We spent all night discussing paranormal stuff and really creeping ourselves out. It got to the point where I had to stop talking about things with her because I was so unnerved by the energy we were stirring up. Shortly thereafter, I bent over to get a trash bag out of a cabinet beneath the sink when I heard a noise from behind and above me. It sounded like a woman's voice, but a combination of a growl and spoken words. It had texture to it. I have never heard anything like it before. It was like somebody speaking from another dimension, almost staticky. I immediately froze and spent a few seconds trying to logically understand what I had just heard. I knew it wasn't the song playing on the radio because it was much louder than that. I knew it wasn't my coworker behind me. But after finding no other explanation, 
I turned around and faced her and said, what was that noise? My coworker looked at me and said, I thought that was you. We were both frozen in disbelief. At the time, we were both equidistant from the espresso bar that had several coffee cups stacked on top. After a couple of seconds of just staring at each other, we both noticed something on the top of the espresso bar moving, and we looked at the same time. One of the cups floated a couple of inches into the air, wiggled a little bit from side to side, and then lowered itself back down. We both looked at each other to confirm what we had just seen, and then we ran to the bathroom on the side of the building, laughing hysterically, flooded with adrenaline. I was just so utterly in awe of what had just happened. I remember saying out loud something like, okay, I get it, I believe you. Not the scariest thing ever, but to this day, the most bizarre and unexplainable thing I have ever witnessed. My fiance and I had just left Ripley's Believe It or Not in Wisconsin Dells, and he was getting hungry. Being that I only survive on antiques and Advil, I wasn't in such a hurry to find him any sustenance. I popped open Chad Lewis's book entitled Paranormal Wisconsin Dells and Baraboo that I had just picked up from Ripley's, and I began to thumb through it in the parking lot eager to find the next stop on our New Year's Day adventure. I settled on the old Baraboo Inn. I'll let you do your own research about it, but I wanted to share my own personal encounter there. Because unless Mr. B.C. Farr is a master electrician with a trick kill switch behind the bar, and there isn't, I absolutely believe that we had a bona fide paranormal experience at Wisconsin's most haunted tavern. According to Google, OBI has a fantastic menu. Depending upon which reviews you read, the food is good too. We set off to Baraboo and found the beautiful stately building easily enough, located at 135 Walnut Street. We went inside and all was quiet. I immediately started looking around, taking in the scene and after a beat or two, we were greeted by an enormous black lab from the back room and a man's voice excitedly welcoming us in. Before I was able to pinpoint where the voice was coming from, a smartly dressed jovial man in probably his 50s popped out from a door behind the bar and asked how we were doing and what brought us in today. I told him we were looking for a drink and a menu and he informed me that they no longer keep a kitchen but he would be more than happy to make us a drink. He said, do you know where you are right now? I laughed and told him that yes, we picked this place out of a book to sightsee, and he proceeded to tell us that we were in the most haunted tavern in Wisconsin. As this conversation transpired, he had begun making our bourbon sours and the jukebox had queued up Hey Tonight by CCR. I was watching him generously pour our drinks and I could see both of his hands for the duration of our exchange. Just as he took his thumb off of the soda gun, the jukebox quit. Just stopped, dead silent in the middle of a song. We all looked over to the old row that was still all lit up, but the number display was flashing zeros. The bartender, who apparently was the owner as well, turned his full body toward it and exclaimed, now, what did you do that for? That was a good tune. He turned to me and said, you just gotta talk to them. Welcome to my world. He went back to finishing my fiance's drink, handed it over to him and held mine for an extra second. He was eyeballing me, probably because I was still looking at the jukebox display. I'd never seen an older one like that just error out before and I found it unusual. He said, that's never happened before. Are you a sensitive? Pardon? I jolted out of the sinking feeling I was having at not fully understanding what had just happened 
and I hadn't realized he was talking to me. Are you a sensitive? He asked again. Do you believe in ghosts? I hesitated, not wanting to make a mark of myself, and I responded, Oh, um, kind of. Well, don't matter. They believe in you, he said. I haven't heard not a peep out of them all day until just now. They're responding to you. Either you're a sensitive or you brought something in here with you. You got some kind of energy. With that, he handed me my drink, waved away my money, and whisked us all to the gangster back bar, as he called it, to watch the episode of Hometown Haunting that just happened to have a feature on Baraboo and the old Baraboo Inn. It was a really neat experience, and that place is certainly invaluable for its historical significance alone. But if you ask me, my final summation is that they don't serve food, but they certainly got some kind of energy. BC Far knows how to make a good stiff one. Last January, I was between jobs, and I had just recently had a daughter, who was at the time about five months old. My husband had been working through my pregnancy, but lost his job. We were living at my mom's house. I have an education in psychology and some experience as a counselor, so I was looking for the best I could get. But the best I could find right away was a job working as a paraprofessional in the special education department of an elementary school in a nearby suburb. The position was unique to the virus times, being that they needed someone to just sit around in the computer room while the kiddos did speech therapy over Zoom. Don't get me started on how terrible virtual speech therapy is. But anyway, my job was to just walk around the school back and forth between classrooms and the computer room picking up kids, taking them to the Zoom room, sitting there for 30 minutes to an hour depending on the kid, taking them back, picking up the next batch. I was overqualified, we'll say. Some days of the week were scheduled tightly, and other days of the week I routinely had just two appointments. The school was a ginormous horseshoe shape, housing 700 elementary school children. I was located all the way at the far back on one side of the pre-K wing. It could take 15 minutes to walk all the way across the building and back when the kids I was picking up were in the older grades. Every day I would make this walk. In the middle of the school, across from the front office, I would always notice, and try to ignore, this strange rag doll with construction paper over its face, showcased in a display case. No bad vibes from it, but it just seemed out of place and random. It was there the entire five months that I worked there, never changing or having anything added to the case. Onward. Well, weird things happened in the computer room where I worked. The doors in the school use a key to lock from both the inside and outside. The doors do not lock automatically. You absolutely 100% have to manually lock them with a key. We are technically supposed to lock rooms when we leave them empty throughout the day, but no one ever did. So I just left my door unlocked when I went to get the kids. I would go get a kid in pre-K, so they'd literally be like two classrooms away, less than a minute to pick them up and walk back. My door would be locked by the time I returned. Sometimes I would be gone longer, but sometimes that's all it would take just 60 seconds. I messed around with the door in my free time, trying to figure out how it was locking. The only conclusion I could come up with was that somebody was manually locking it when I was gone. I asked the janitor, because he was always around, and he said no, he'd never done it. I asked if it could lock itself, and he said no, it's not possible. So I came to the conclusion that somebody was messing with me, trying to teach me a lesson for not locking my door or something passive aggressively. Well, I don't play that. So I texted my boss, the vice principal, 
and I asked her to come talk to me when she had some time. I explained the situation to her, and she said that she was sure that nobody would ever do something like that. She also said she would have maintenance look at the door. That was the end of it. I come back after the weekend, and the door is broken, like off kilter on the hinges so it won't even shut all the way. I guess locking on its own won't be a problem anymore. The school did have security cameras in the halls. I wonder if they had any video of me pushing the doorknob down to check that it was unlocked before walking off, returning and having it being locked. Anyway, after that, there was a day where I went to get a kid out of his classroom in the pre-K wing by my office, but they switched up the schedule that day so the class wasn't in there. I shrugged it off, went to go pick up the other kid that also sat in there for this block, and then came back. There was another paraprofessional watching her own kids in the playroom nearby, so I asked her if she knew where the other class would be right now. She said she didn't know, but that she thought she had just seen a kid run in there. Maybe they were going in to use the bathroom. I said, okay, and I went back into the empty classroom. I have the other little kid with me at this point. There's a bathroom at the back of the class, but it's open. I walk over there, confused, and check the room. I even look behind the door, and there is no kid. I shrug my shoulders at the other little one and begin walking back toward the exit of the room. The bathroom door slams shut behind me. The other little kid jumped out of his skin. I tried to remain calm. The other paraprofessional nearby sees us out in the hallway, peering into the empty classroom, presumably looking very puzzled and a little freaked out. She asks if the kid was in there. I said, no, but the door slammed behind me when I was walking out. I trailed off, looking down at the kiddo with me, who was looking back up at me with his eyes as wide as ever. Probably just the wind, I say. The other para kind of looks at me crazy but shrugs it off and keeps about her business. The kid I was with, I kid you not, whispers, it was a ghost. And of course, I say, no, no, I'm sure it was just because I messed with the door. You know, the obvious. Incident blows off, a couple of weeks pass by, and I'm in the empty computer room working on art for the walls. It's Wednesday, so it's an early day for pre-K, and all of the littles have gone home, while the real teachers are in a staff meeting. Someone knocks at my office door. Mind you, the door no longer shuts all the way, so I figure they don't want to barge in. I get up from my desk five feet away, and I open the door. Nobody is there. I look down the hallway, and nobody is there. I go sit back down, more annoyed than anything, and it happens again. At this point, I'm kind of fed up. I do practice witchcraft, and I've been doing so seriously for more than 16 years but I have no mediumship abilities or anything like that. I don't deal with ghosts and spirits in my practice, but that's the reason that I'm not scared at this point. I ask the janitor if the place is haunted. Man, this guy doesn't skip a beat. And he says, oh yeah, Rodney? Rodney, yeah, that little boy, he died in there. They named that doll across from the office after him, you know? What the heck? I asked my supervisor to confirm this and she said, oh yeah, no one ever told you about Rodney, huh? I'm like, yeah, well that could have been in your ad. So at this point, I've become acquaintances with the school librarian. I ask her about what's going on. She says all kinds of people have had weird experiences. Night janitors have had things move on their own. One time, the top principal had an alarm go off showing somebody was down in the basement at 3 a.m. But none of the outside doors had gone off and nobody was on video in the school at the time. I guess another time over spring break, the doll across from the office got ripped up in his display case, his head laying on the ground, which is why he has a construction paper on him now. No one on camera and nothing on the camera of the doll. Another staff member never believed in ghosts until she saw a little boy run into a classroom and then promptly disappear. 
that's about the extent of things that happened to me there. But I became fascinated. Some staff knew of the ghost. Some had never heard anything about it. Mostly, staff who worked on my side of the building had experiences. The other side of the building seemed like a whole other world. Totally normal. No ghosts over there. I became the weird ghost girl, I'm sure, always asking people if they'd seen anything. I am not the person to pretend like nothing's going on, so as not to stir the pot. No way. Of course, I'd never let the kiddos hear me. No one other than the janitor ever seemed to have heard of anybody dying at the school. But people who had heard of the ghost, or had experiences, did have their theories. One day, I asked a paraprofessional from another school in the district, because at a meeting, she mentioned that she herself had attended that elementary school where I worked. She didn't know anything about a ghost, but she did say that while she attended, a boy died at the school, in the wing, where I work. He had the flu and his heart gave out. It's actually a really very sad story that I'll just spare you, but she could corroborate. She said that they hung a drawing of him up in the hallway to commemorate him. Sure enough, among the plaques, there's this framed picture of a swimming hole and a mountain in memory of Ernie, not Rodney. I found a much better job and quit during summer vacation, but I did tell Ernie or Rodney or whoever in the silence of the computer room in the last week of school that if he wanted to, he could cross over that he didn't have to be stuck at the school. I even had a sacred place out in the country where I believe the veil is thin and that he was welcome to come there with me. Like I said, no psychic abilities here, but I did drive out there on the last day and I put down a birdhouse for Ernie. I really hope that he's doing well. So, a little backstory. I went to a special needs school for nine years, one of the Tevin schools in Denmark. The buildings are over 130 years old, and they have a lot of history, including being a tuberculosis treatment center. The basement was where all the creative things were, like paint and stone cutter tools, the library, and some other things. At the time, I was 13 to 14. I'm female, I was also very creative, and I loved to go down there after school because I could just hide in there and be myself and make things. To get there, you'd have to walk through a very loud door, go left just a little bit, and then go through another door, a glass door, and then finally the last door. You could always, always hear it when somebody was coming down there because it was just so loud. The person who was supposed to be taking care of me left, and I was alone in the basement in that room. I heard the door and everything, and them walking up the stairs. Then, I heard a whisper. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but it was definitely a woman. The person who was taking care of me was a man, so it wasn't him. I looked to where I had heard the whisper, and this is where I saw a transparent woman in old-fashioned clothing. From what I could tell, it seemed like something was running down her face. When I think about it now, maybe it was blood, but it was pretty dark. We made eye contact. Surprisingly, I wasn't scared. I didn't really think about it. It was normal to see things down there, to hear things. I asked if she was okay, and she screamed in a way that I can't describe. Honestly, it was like a banshee. And then she just disappeared. The weird thing is, my stepdad's father passed away a little over a week later. To this day, I can't be totally sure what I saw down there. I know banshees aren't from Denmark, but that scream, it was odd and different. It wasn't like a normal scream. And 
them being harbingers of doom and all that, and then something bad happening later. I don't know. I'm 21 now, and I'm still as confused as I was back then. All I know is that that school was definitely haunted, because I'm not the only one who saw some things there. This is a description of events that happened to me during my time as a security guard at a local factory. Obviously, I can't give any locations or names, but I will say that it happened in Germany. I have been working at this place for about two years. It's an old chemical factory that was built in the early 1900s before World War I. I don't know much more about its history other than that, though. For the first few months, all went pretty smoothly, but after a while, I started noticing some things that were quite odd. The first thing I noticed on my nightly rounds was that in some buildings, the lights seemed to turn on or off on their own, but I wrote that off as the old electrical installations, which could act quirky sometimes, or employees forgetting to turn the light off. Employees could act quirky too, the thing is, that stuff kept happening, even when there was nobody else but me on the premises. I could check a building at the start of my round, only to return 30 minutes later, to find every light in the building turned on, but the doors still locked. There was one particular building that constantly gave me the creeps. A flat, one-story building that was basically one long hallway with office rooms on either side. Every time I walked through that hallway to check if all the offices were locked, I felt like somebody was just behind me, looking over my shoulder. It was also in this building that I heard whispers or sighs from one of the offices, but they were always empty, and all of the electronic equipment that could have caused those noises were turned off or in some cases unplugged. Another building that I had weird stuff happen in was the metal workshop. The weirdest thing was that one night I heard a noise from within. And when I entered, all of the machines, the drills, the saws, everything were on and running. I just ran in, hit the main emergency switch and got out of there. That night, again, I was the only one there. I tried to talk with some of my colleagues about it, but they said that if I wanted to keep my job, I'd better stop talking about these things, as management didn't take too kindly to people asking questions. So I haven't asked any more questions, but I definitely have some. My family owns a factory in the north of England. The building is 1890s as far as I can tell, and was built as a large shed for boilers that provided steam to power the steam engines in the big mill next door. The mill has since been demolished. It has a large water tank underneath it and a system to collect rainwater. The roof is made with cast iron trestles that incorporate internal gutters. It's fascinating. My brother is convinced that the place is haunted. Stuff apparently moves around on its own, and voices have been heard in the factory from the office when the factory was empty. We had an old bloke working for us a few years back who swears he saw the ghost of a man on several occasions. He did used to secretly drink several cans of John Smith's bitter whilst on shift though, so who knows. But he's not the only one. So far, I haven't experienced anything. But if I do, I'll be sure to let you know.
My parents live in a community in the desert of southwestern United States. After graduating college, I spent some time living at their house, going through the misery of unemployment and applying for jobs. Being away from the city, their neighborhood can get really dark at night, especially when there are clouds or the moon isn't out. This neighborhood has had some issues with the paranormal. People have posted on the Facebook community page asking if anyone has had strange experiences with the comments on the posts always blowing up with people sharing encounters. Dogs barking and growling at entities not visible in the house, silverware and dishes going missing over time, only to later find it mysteriously in the attic, shadow figures, things like that. One late night, I was alone at their house, watching television. My parents were gone on vacation back east. My parents have this odd cat, who is the living definition of a scaredy cat. Even though it enjoys going outside, the cat won't go unless you're out there with it. If you go back inside, the cat will immediately be cowering in the windows, begging to be let in. As I was watching television, the cat comes darting past my feet to the sliding glass door that opens to the backyard. She was in that low, sneaking position the cats get in when they see something they want to hunt or pounce on. She was frozen, fixated, on something in the back corner of the yard. Out of curiosity of what the cat was seeing, I opened the sliding glass door and let her out. She immediately runs up to the bushes in the corner of the yard and stops, still in the low sneaking position. I walked outside, wondering what in the world was going on. This was one of those dark nights with no moon in the sky, making it difficult to see anything except the outline of the bushes. Suddenly, an orb of bright yellow light flies out of the bushes about the size of a softball. The orb goes up and over the cinder block wall into the neighbor's yard. Both the cat and I jump out of fright. I run back inside, being filled with the familiar dreaded feeling of being around something paranormal. Collecting my courage, I grab a flashlight and I go back out to see if anything's there and to find the cat. I go back to the corner of the backyard, and I see nothing in the bushes where the orb had come out of. I search the whole yard, and I can't find the cat, who was also too little to jump the cinder block walls. The whole time I was outside again just felt wrong, like I shouldn't be there. I went back inside and waited a couple of hours until the cat finally showed up in the windowsill in a state of panic. I knew that I saw something with this experience because it was this little weird cat who brought it to my attention. A few days later, my parents are back from their vacation and I tell them about my weird experience. This kind of freaked my mom out who has read the community Facebook posts about the neighborhood having paranormal activity Going to bed, I suddenly see a bunch of police cars show up outside the neighbor's house and our house. Police are getting out with their guns drawn. I alert my parents and we lurk in the windows wondering what in the world is happening. I see the next door neighbor girl outside, talking to the police. Nothing really happened except the police searched her house. The next day, my dad calls our neighbor asking if everything was okay and if they could help. Apparently, their daughter was home alone while they were away. She was walking in the hallway when she saw a black shadowy figure in the house at the end of the hall. She screamed and ran for her phone and called the police. The police searched the house and the surrounding area, but found nobody and didn't find any evidence of a break-in. It was the neighbor's house their bushes, actually, that the orb had flown out of a few nights prior. Mm -hmm. 
My mom's side of the family lived in another town, about seven hours away. We would visit from time to time. My aunt's houses were always haunted and strange things were always happening there. I saw ghosts a lot. Well, this time she lived at a ranch in the middle of nowhere, miles from the nearest town. When I was about eight or nine years old, my grandma on my mom's side passed away. We went to stay at my aunt's house to visit and later to go to the funeral. While we were visiting the first night, my older brother and cousins stayed up in the kitchen, cooking and talking. My mom, dad, and I were all in the far bedroom down the hall from the kitchen. I was watching TV and my parents were falling asleep. My brother called me into the kitchen and asked me if I wanted corn on the cob. I said no. He asked me to ask my mom if she wanted one. I walked back into the room and asked my mom and she said no as well. I went back into the hallway and told my brother that mom didn't want any corn, but he just stared at me with huge eyes wide open. He just said, okay. I didn't think much about it at the time. I just thought that how he looked at me was really strange. The next day, my brother and I drove to town to get something to eat. That's when he told me, when I asked my mom if she wanted corn, that he saw a woman standing behind me. She followed me into the room. He thought it was my mom at first, but then the woman vanished. I told him mom and dad were laying in bed when that happened. That's why he was looking at me strangely. But he said that he didn't want to tell me that night because I would have been scared. We ended up getting a hotel the next night and we didn't stay at my aunt's again. My brother was too freaked out. This is the true story of my childhood through adult years as I recount it. Rattlesnake Road is an original name to a road that has since been changed. I used it to maintain anonymity. I was born on Long Island, New York, and ever since I can remember, I've had really strange experiences. I was never able to sleep at night, and from a young age, I was always terrified of the dark. Yes, every child is afraid of the dark, but I was afraid for a reason that I was unable to explain until later in life. There are a few stories from while I was there, but I want to fast forward to when I was a little bit older and things began to make sense to me. My family purchased a second home and we moved to Colorado. We lived on a ranch located at the top of a hill that fed into the Rocky Mountains. There wasn't much around us, a few neighbors, our barn with our animals, and thousands of acres of hilly and mountainous terrain that surrounded our family. There was a long dirt road that led to our property, Rattlesnake Road. It was a perfect shot of the scenery leading up to our small three-bedroom home. It was quiet, peaceful, but the land was old. I was about seven years old at the time, this is when I began to understand what I was going through wasn't normal. Our home was small. It was a ranch style house with a three car garage, which took up half of the structure. The other half was built into the hillside where you entered from the front. You walked into the living room and you could see straight out the back sliding doors into the plains. In front of you was the kitchen, old with brick. Straight down the hallway, my room was on the right, my brother's room followed that, and lastly my parents' room was on the left. The bathrooms connected and were on the right as well, wrapping around to the back of the house. I left the hallway lights on when I slept. I was scared to begin with, but something always felt as though it wasn't just our family there. One night, I was up and I couldn't fall back asleep. My parents and brother were sleeping as well. I could hear them snoring down the hall. 
My bedroom door was open and I was facing the hallway, when suddenly the pull string to my closet made a click and the lights popped on. I could see the light making its way through the slatted shades of my closet accordion doors, and my heart began to race. Then, they shut off. The air in the room became cold, tense, almost as though the oxygen was being siphoned out. The silence set in. I couldn't hear the snoring anymore. I couldn't hear anything. I looked toward the hallway, and there was a short, black static mist. It had no facial features, but what I could see would have been a mouth. It seemed as though it was smiling ear to ear, which paralyzed me with an intense feeling of dread. It passed out my doorway and out of sight, not making a sound. Moments later, I heard what sounded like the door to our garage open and close and the air lifted. All of my surroundings returned to normal. I knew I was awake. I knew what I had seen there. And it visited me, only to get worse as time went on. That image will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. Make of this story what you will, but it happened. Back in 2009, Ireland was going through the recession, but I still managed to buy a house. It was a nice little cottage, and it suited me perfectly as I was a single man. I did shift work, so it was nights and days, days and nights. Initially, I thought it was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, but things started to happen within the house that I couldn't explain. For instance, one night I was doing some ironing. I put a towel on the railing in the bathroom and went back into the kitchen to get some more clothes to hang and put away. I came back up and the towel that I had put on the bathroom rail was strewn across the bedroom floor. My first thought was that there was somebody in the house with me, so I ran back into the kitchen and grabbed the frying pan. It was a small house, so there was really nowhere for someone to hide. After a while, I reasoned that it couldn't have been an intruder, because the door was locked and all of the windows were shut. It scared the life out of me, but I convinced myself that I just wasn't paying attention, and that maybe I did leave my towel in the middle of the room, even though I knew that I didn't. But things got worse as time went on and couldn't be dismissed so easily. It got to the stage where I was actually afraid of being in my own home. For instance, coming in from a particular night at work, there was a light switch on in the hallway by the doorway. I'd have to switch that on before I'd even open the door fully. I was so terrified that I wouldn't even look into the darkness. Sometimes when I would open the door at nighttime, there would be a gust of wind coming from the house to greet me when no windows were open and there was no way for that to really happen. It eventually got to the stage where I was beginning to wonder if I was losing my mind. This went on for months, things going missing, curtains being closed when I left a room and being partially open when I came back in minutes later. The final straw was when I actually saw something. I arrived home one night at about three o'clock in the morning after being at work. I opened the hall door and switched on the light. Just to give you a picture of the layout of the house, it was quite small. There was a hallway and down the end of the hallway was a doorway to a bathroom. The bathroom was out the back and the kitchen was to the left. This night in particular, I switched on the light and opened the door fully to be greeted by, all I can say is it was a big man's shadow. And this thing was standing at the end of the hall. 
Now, how it was a shadow is beyond me, because there were three spotlights running down the hall, and they lit up everywhere. But this shadow stood under the light, and it was facing me. Every hair on my body stood on edge. The fright and the fear and the panic was so intense. I just roared out, leave me alone, just leave me the F alone. And with that, whatever it was turned sideways and I could see the whole profile of his face. There was a massive bang and a chair was sent flying up the hallway toward me. I legged it out of the house, got back in my car, and traveled back up to my parents' house. I was so distraught. I had a brother living in our parents' house at the time, and he thought I'd been in an accident or something. I tried to explain to him as best I could what had happened. I hadn't said anything to anybody about the goings-on at the house. I'd been living there for about six months, and it had been going on all that time. Almost every day something happened. Being terrified in your own home is a horrible feeling. My brother and I drove back down to the house the following day. We found the chair that had been thrown at me in the hallway, on top of the kitchen table. I had a bottle of water in the fridge, and I took it out and placed it on the kitchen table. As my brother and I were talking, the bottle just burst. It was like somebody had shaken a Coke can and opened it. It just went everywhere. Every surface of the kitchen seemed to have water on it. I sold the house six months later. During the months between putting the house up for sale and eventually selling it, strange things continued to happen within the house, like things going missing and curtains being moved. Thankfully though, I never saw the apparition again. One night I was lying in bed it was about one o'clock in the morning, and coming from the back of the house, I heard a woman's voice say, No doctor, please. Petrified, I jumped out of bed and turned on all the lights. I searched everywhere. I checked that the door was locked. It was, and the windows were all shut. The television wasn't plugged in, because sometimes it turned on by itself. Same for the radio, which I also left unplugged. I'll never forget the sadness in her voice and the way she said it. It wasn't, no doctor, please help me. It was, no doctor, please help me. Like, for some reason she couldn't trust the doctor, or she couldn't afford one. I was so glad to be out of that house when I finally sold it. When I was living there, I asked a neighbor, and he told me that the couple who I'd bought the house off of had been complaining about hearing things in the house, at least the wife had been. I don't know what I saw or heard, but I do know that whatever it was, it was definitely something that was within the house, because I've never experienced anything like that again. I don't know whether the couple who bought the house off of me experienced anything. I couldn't say. After all these years, I still don't really talk about this with people, as I don't want them to think I'm crazy. But I do know that this happened to me. My life was always crazy, but never did I think it was this crazy. This is my story. It was a summer day in 2011. I was 10 and my dad had gotten with his ex-girlfriend. That's a story for a different time. She had two boys. One was a year younger and the other one was older. I had a little brother as well. Now that you know the family, let me give you a little bit of background to this bone chilling story. My dad was searching for a house to rent after breaking things off with my biological mother and he found this house, and what's crazy is that my name is Ashley, and it was off of Ashland Street. It seemed to be very cheap for the area. It was in a gated community, so of course it seemed very comfortable and safe. I mean, at least you'd think so. I moved with my dad into this house with his ex-girlfriend and her two boys, so there were four kids all together. 
We'll name them Kobe, the year younger, and Jerry, the older one, and then my little brother, Brandon. I have changed their names for privacy. It was an older house, so nothing brand new was built, but it was definitely pretty cheap. I mean, for a gated high middle-class neighborhood. We moved in. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the summertime. I live in Vegas, so the heat is sometimes unbearable. One day it can be 99, and the next it's 104. My dad wakes me up and is really excited about moving out and just being free. My biological mother was a freeloader and a real piece of work. My dad and I picked up all our boxes and we went to the house. Now this is the first time that I was seeing it, but of course my dad did a tour with the landlord. So I went through the place picking my bedroom and all the fun things you do when you move into a brand new house. I shared a room with my baby brother, Brandon. He was like four or five at the time, so really young. I got the room I wanted, I guess out of the three I could have picked. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two upstairs and one downstairs. The first night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. We got Little Caesars pizza and watched Cops, my dad's favorite TV show. We went to bed and woke up like normal and went on about our day. Again, still really normal, nothing crazy. The second night was just as normal. It was about a week into living in the house when things started to happen. It was almost like the ghosts wanted to make sure we stayed or something. How sweet. So it was more like night eight and I was walking up the stairs. I was alone in the house and the stairs had carpet. I walked up them and I swear I kept hearing somebody walking behind me. But every time I would turn around, nothing would be there. I just kind of kept it to myself and told myself I was just paranoid for being at the new house by myself. I was the type of kid that was scared of the dark, and I still get scared easily to this day. I actually hate Halloween for that very reason. But these strange things just kept happening. The first spirit sighting was Kobe's birthday. He got a new spyware truck thing where you can put a camera on the toy truck and go around the house. It's kind of like a GoPro. Well, we decided to pull a prank on Jerry, so we put the camera in his room to prank him. He was asleep, so he would wake up and freak out that there was a camera. I mean, we were all under 12, so it was really funny to us, but that's not all I caught. I know the typical white woman in a white robe thing, I get it, but it was true. All we could see was a silhouette of a young woman, probably in her late 20s or early 30s, standing over him. Of course, as the two young boys were so sweet, they had me go up to check myself. So of course I went upstairs, a little spooked, but trying not to overthink it. And I went into his room. Jerry was still asleep and there was no woman in there. So I came downstairs and told myself that there's probably a glitch in the camera that just made it seem like somebody was there. So we all let it go. As some of you probably know, when you move into a house, especially an older one, the floor creaks and you might hear bumps in the night just because the furniture is settling, but only squeaks and creaks for a day or two. We kept hearing this noise almost like somebody was walking up and down the stairs all the time. But again, we all just put it out of our heads and said that it was the house settling. Maybe something fell. No matter what, we would try to find an explanation for the situation. But over time, it just got worse. My dad had signed an 18 month lease agreement, but we only stayed there for four because this is when things got absolutely crazy. I went off to school. I was in the fifth grade. I had to repeat the second grade, hence why I was in the fifth grade at 10 years old. Anyway, my school was definitely a walkable distance, so I walked to school and back home. I got home one day and my dad's girlfriend was at work, and so was my dad. 
Kobe and Jerry were at their grandma's and Brandon was still in school, so I was all alone in the house. When I walked in, it was like something out of a horror movie. Picture this. You get home from a stressful day at school, and when you open the door, it literally looks like somebody has robbed the place. The stove was on. Yes, the stove, like literal fire, was on. Of course, my immediate reaction was to call my dad and tell him what was going on. As I got into the kitchen, all the cabinet doors were open, and most of the plates were on the ground, shattered. There was glass everywhere, even on the carpet. Thank God we didn't have any animals at the time. My dad, of course, got home with the cops, and the cops came in and did an investigation, all to find out that there was no foul play, so there was nothing anybody could really do. So, of course, my dad's now ex-girlfriend blames me, but I told her that I didn't do it, that I came home to this. Unfortunately, my dad played right into her crap and believed her, so I was grounded for breaking her plates and causing a fire. I was so mad, but I was 10. What was I going to do, run away? I kept trying to convince my dad that I didn't do this, but pretty soon, he wouldn't need any convincing. While we were all downstairs playing and talking one day, upstairs in my parents' bedroom, there were three loud booms, all at one after the other, just boom, boom, boom. My dad and his now ex and myself all ran up the stairs to find that my parents' bed was broken. It almost looked like somebody had jumped on it really hard, and that's how it broke. The mattress was caved into the bed frame. I just looked at my dad with a cocky attitude and said, so did I do that too? My dad actually apologized to me that night, but not his girlfriend. She never liked me, but that was another story, like I said. Under the staircase, we had storage. The door to that slammed, but the AC unit was close by the door. So I just thought that maybe somebody had left it open and the wind had pushed it shut. It wasn't a very heavy door. The next night was definitely one of the scariest nights of my life. It was around 8 p.m. and we were all settling down for the night. I had school the next morning as everybody was going to bed. It was around 10 going on 11. As I was about to sit on the bed, I heard two knocks on the door. I could see a shadowy impression of feet under the door. So when I opened it, it was confusing to see nobody there. I closed it again, thinking that it had to be one of my brothers playing a mean trick on me. Again, I scare easily, so that was their thing. I heard the knocks again, and like the first time, I opened it. But nothing was there, and I didn't hear anybody run away. I went to Kobe's room. He was fast asleep. Then I went to Jerry's room, but he was still awake. He told me he didn't knock or anything, and that he'd been in his room the whole entire time, but I didn't really believe him. I had no choice to just go back to my room and try to relax. Probably about another hour went by, with nothing, no knocking or anything. But just as I had closed my eyes, I heard it again. I stood right by my door for about 10 minutes until the knocking happened again, and I immediately opened the door. Absolutely nothing. And then, in the silent darkness, I heard a giggle. I looked around the corner, and there was nothing there. Everybody was asleep, and nobody would have had time to get back to their bedroom. I just went to bed. I wanted it to be over so badly. The next morning, I tried to tell my dad what was happening, but he said I was just dreaming. I looked at him and said, so was the kitchen and the fire and the bed. That was all a dream too, right? Because we're all either having some really crazy Jumanji stuff happening or there's more to it. My dad just shrugged it all off and told me to get ready for school. So I did. Probably about another week later, I ended up staying the night at a friend's house. I'll call her Emma, just again for privacy reasons. So after school, I took the bus back to Emma's house. I decided to confide in her about what had been going on. Her mother was a medium, so I guess she could like speak to the souls that hadn't crossed over or something. Or as she would say, departed. 
When I came in close contact with her, she looked at me with fear in her eyes. It was like she knew what was going on before I even told her. She told me that I had a very negative soul attached to me. It was a female soul. And all I could think was maybe it was my dad's ex or even my biological mother. Two really horrible females. But she said that it wasn't anybody I knew closely. And that's when I started to piece everything together. The woman standing over the bed, the fire, the bed breaking, the knocking, the giggling. It somehow all made sense in some way. This spirit was stuck. But my question was, how did she get there in the first place? My dad picked me up the morning after, and I discussed with him what I had kind of put together. He said maybe the landlord would know more. So I told my dad to give him a call and tell him the pipe was loose or something so he could come over and have a conversation. You know, trick him, I guess. If he doesn't want to go into detail about it, he's definitely not going to over the phone. My dad agreed and a few hours later the landlord arrived. My dad called me downstairs and we decided to go over everything with him, from the fire to the glass to the bed breaking to the woman standing over the bed. All the color drained from his face and I immediately knew that he knew something. As we were all talking downstairs in the living room, there was this mirror on the wall in front of us over the television. We're sitting on the couch and as I looked up, I saw a lady wearing a very tall, almost like black witch hat, and she had very long gray hair. She just looked off, like I knew from somewhere, but didn't at the same time. Of course, I reacted very startled and my dad told me to relax. Like, yeah, dad, let me just relax why all this stuff keeps happening. Why don't I just tell the ghost to make us a campfire as well? He didn't find it funny and sent me to my room. The landlord eventually left and fewer questions were answered. It was like he didn't want to say anything. Like our house almost blew up into flames and there was glass all over the kitchen. This isn't the time for secrets. Anyway, we looked up the address on a background search for properties and we only found two things that could have been connected to this haunting. The first thing was that the entire neighborhood had been built on a Native American burial ground, but that seemed a little cliche, so we kept digging. And then we found something even sadder. A young couple was there. They had lived there once. They had two children. One day, out of nowhere, the dad came home drunk. He shot his wife and two kids, and then set the house on fire and shot himself. Unfortunately, the house did burn to the ground and their remains were never found, so nobody knew who they were. It made total sense. The fire that started, the loud booms, the knocking. It was a sick memory that I'll never forget. I really hope that family rests in peace. At least the wife and the kids. I can't imagine being taken out like that by your own father and husband. Anyway... That was the haunted house on Ashland Street. I've never been back since we moved out, and I'll never go back again. My husband at the time and I had been married about a year when one of his friends told us that they were buying a house. Their rental house would be available, and the rent was very reasonable. His wife's parents knew the owner of the house, and he was fine with us moving in. We said yes, since we were happy to leave our small apartment. My husband told me that the house was pretty nice. He and his friend's band practiced there all the time. Weird stuff started happening right away. I worked and went to school during the day, while my husband was a working musician, so he was gone until very late. I woke up in bed one night, and I heard the front screen door spring squeak open. Oh, my husband's home, I thought. He put the key in the lock, opened the door, and quietly let the screen door shut. I was still in bed as I heard him walking across the living room, so I called out hello to him and told him he doesn't need to be quiet because I'm awake. 
He didn't answer, so I called out again. The house was quiet. I looked at my cat, who was in bed with me, and she was on high alert, sitting straight up, eyes wide, staring at the bedroom door. I don't know how long we hid out in the bedroom, but some time later the screen opened again, and it was all louder. The door unlocked, and it was my husband this time. These events happened quite a few times, but sometimes it was just footsteps. There were often crashing sounds in the house, like a broom handle hitting the floor. Cabinet doors would be opened, and small appliances would be turned on for no good reason. We started unplugging everything when we weren't using it to avoid this. Guests, and later roommates, also experienced the same things. The house had a reputation with the neighbors, who called it Tragedy House. Once I was sitting at the table in the kitchen, and a tall black thing flew from the wall behind me on my left, through the kitchen and out the outside wall. It happened in just a second, but I remember thinking it had to hit that wall, but it didn't, it just went straight through it. The house's owner, our landlord, told me that his wife had died while they were on vacation years earlier. She fell down some stairs, leaving him with three small children. He said that she loved this house. He would always say, I can still feel her here when I come in. You and me both, buddy. You and me both. I've lived in the same house for a decade now. The old lady who used to live here died, and her best friend still lives next door. I'm not sure how long she has left. But this house has always been spooky. It's always cold. It's really old. And I have had a lot of weird experiences for years. It's very common for me to hear footsteps, doors opening and closing, and my cat staring at random corners. My front door once opened and slammed closed by itself, and my mother saw an apparition of a Victorian lady in the front hallway in the middle of the night. I was also once home alone showering downstairs, and I heard somebody aggressively pacing back and forth in my room, opening and slamming my drawers closed. After a while, you get used to it, and you just accept the flow of things. For a while, the activity died down, and things seemed less scary. Plus, I moved away for university, so I got a huge break from the spooky stuff. But now I'm back, and the activity has spiked. A few nights ago, I was having a particularly hard mental health day. I was up at about 4 a.m., facing the wall, trying to sleep with my back to the door. My radio is always on at a low volume, and the music was playing. But I suddenly hear the voice of a woman behind me, almost groaning. It sounded like she was letting all the air out of her lungs, almost like wheezing. I freaked out, and when I looked, there was no one there. Yesterday, I was FaceTiming my boyfriend and I heard footsteps in my house again, which I haven't heard in months. Distinct paces up the stairs, shuffling on the floorboards. I was genuinely scared, and even thought it was an actual intruder, but nobody was there. I'm scared that perhaps I'm manifesting something. I've never heard a woman before in this house, and the wheezing was so clear. I don't want to sound dramatic, but I'm scared of losing my sanity, and maybe I am, but my house has always been spooky, and this sudden spike has no real explanation. I'm going to try to smudge the house with some herbs that I gathered to feel a little bit safer. Hopefully, it works.
My husband and I met a guy who used to work in our house. In conversation one day, he said, so have you met the ghosts yet? My husband started laughing and said, we sure have. We were a little bit skeptical as to whether we'd imagined the things that happened, but laborers working here have been very unsettled by some events, and in some cases, they've refused to come back. We've always lived in houses where strange things happen, but this one has really been a wild ride. It's very haunted. Noises, floorboards creaking with footsteps, bangs, doors opening, lights and sockets switching on and off, things moving, voices, shadows, it's crazy. He also told us some of the things that happened here. It's a very old house, and in recent years it was a home for addicts with new babies. A lot of serious, horrific trauma happened here. I cried when he told us about it. It's unsurprising to me, therefore, that the energy here is so charged. Knowing this, I thought that over the weekend I might light some candles and sage the house, and invite anything to leave that needs to go, though I suppose some will probably want to stay. I'd be interested to know what you would do here. Our family and friends have said to move out, but we like it here. We don't have any bad experiences, really. We're not frightened. And, as far as advice goes, I don't really want any advice on exorcisms or fleeing the house. The worst thing we've ever experienced was a disembodied groaning noise. It was very human and very strange. But if it was intended to frighten us, it didn't. I raised my eyebrows at my husband and then carried on working. Last night, my husband and I opened doors and windows all throughout the house. We started in the cellar and worked our way up through the house. There are 28 rooms or spaces, so it took us ages. I used white sage sticks, tea light candles, and a bowl each to carry the candles in, which were gifts from loved ones and sentimental to us. As we moved through the house, I just talked, asking any spirits who didn't respect us or wanted to harm us to leave our house, that this was our home and we wouldn't tolerate it and that if anybody wished to stay, they could, but they had to respect us and treat us with kindness and we would do the same. In the rooms where we felt the most oppressive energy, one bedroom in particular, I spent a while talking out loud to any spirits trapped here because of the traumatic house history. I said that they were free to move on now and to go and find their loved ones. Who knows if it did anything, but I felt like we had to try, so I did it with belief and conviction. My husband had a strange interaction in the cellar where the sage was knocked from his hand, but he remained firm and told them that they had to leave and they weren't allowed to touch him. Our cat was avidly watching the house spirit cat as usual and following it around. And then he seemed to be watching and following things with his eyes through the kitchen to the back door. We were just watching, fascinated. I said thank you, just in case they were leaving, so we'll see if things get better. We'll see if they seem more peaceful. I certainly slept very well last night, so fingers crossed.